Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm with OCTO, Open Communications for the Ocean. Um, at OCTO, I coordinate the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, as well as edit the newsletter, the Skimmer on Marine Ecosystems and Management. We also have uh, Nick Weiner from OCTO here uh, as co-host of the webinar. And we're very pleased to welcome here today, um, Stuart Fulton and Gabby Cuevas with COBE. Um, and Stuart is going to be presenting on the Presca data app, mobilizing knowledge and creating a more just digital economy for small scale fishers. And Gabby is going to be helping to answer any questions that come in uh, through the chat and the Q&A. Um, so for this webinar, uh, we'll have an initial presentation and then time at the end for question and answer. Um, we encourage you to send in questions at any point during the webinar. You can send them in either through typing them into the question panel um, or into the chat panel. With the chat, um, it's open to everyone to send messages, uh, both to just the panelists or, the, or individual presenters or um, the moderators, or um, just or you can send things to the entire audience. Um, and so you are free to post um, thoughts and comments and additional resources. We just ask that you keep it professional, anything that you're posting in the chat for everyone. Okay, well, welcome, um, Stuart and Gabby. I'll, I'll turn it over to you now, Stuart. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, so good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're based. Um, as Sarah said, I'm Stuart Fulton. I'm based in Mexico with, with a nonprofit called COBE, Comunidad de Biodiversidad. And my colleague, Gabby Cuevas, is in the chat as well um, for any, anything that comes up during the, call, uh, during the, the, the speech. Um, feel free to post questions as we go, and we'll and we'll have definitely have some time at the end to, to do any uh, any Q and A. So, what I want to talk about today is is how we can mobilize technology for good in, in small scale fisheries. Now, I'm going to talk about an app called Pescadata, but we're also going to range out on some important principles of, of working with technology. So, so we're going to discuss uh, in this. Sort of broad ranging talk. Um, surveillance technology, uh, the evolution of the internet, privacy, small scale fishing, the SDGs, um, platform cooperatives, data silos, and, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. I'll talk for around 30 minutes or so. Uh, it's not too long, and then we'll have time for, for questions and discussion. So we're going to start far outside uh, the marine realm and with an issue that probably most of you are familiar with, but avoid thinking about too much now. Um, it, maybe it's like the way we the way we know we have a problem with our, our carbon footprint and things, but maybe we don't uh, try and we, we have a space inside our, uh, our our head where we keep it safe. <laughs> um, so we're we're in the area the era of surveillance capitalism, you know, and data are valuable. We know that platforms collect a lot of data on us, um, and you might feel that I've started this talk by uh, maybe overstating or, or even understating the problem at hand. So if you wanna. You can try go to Amazon and buy the product on the right there, and it's only ten dollars. And you can see the, the fun that al Amazon's algorithms will have for for a few days afterwards. So um, these are some of the things we want to discuss. And how do we get here? No, we're in the era of, of the Web 2.0. So the Web 1.0, you may ask, is is a, in a period that ended around 2004. Uh, these were personal and, and company web pages, mostly static. With banner ads, if, if you're if you remember that period, um, Web 2.0 was the area or is the area of social. Uh, websites became interactive. Social media came of age. Uh, blogs came about, and we generate that we as users generate the content on, on someone else's platform. Um, and then what is the Web 3.0? So we're on the cusp of this this new era. Uh, the Web 3.0 is a more intelligent web, but it's also where the individual is sovereign. It's, it's our web. And, and one, of the, one of the things we're going to discuss today are our components of this, this web 3.0 and how we can apply them uh, to, to marine conservation and sustainable fishing. So taking us back to, back to fisheries, um, small scale fishing communities um, are particularly vulnerable to, to global shocks and changes. No? Um, this has been ever more, more apparent with the pandemic, yet it's a hugely important market uh, and also a source of food and livelihoods for, for millions of, of people around the world. This talk, we're gonna sort of talk more about uh, Latin American small scale fisheries, but many of the concepts can, can apply to other areas. So at the same time, 
we also have a 50 trillion a 50 trillion dollar funding gap required to, to meet funding levels to meet the sdgs and sdg 14 alone uh needs around 175 billion dollars a year um, but this is to save a, a three trillion dollar a year market for marine and coastal resources so that's not if we look at it on that scale it's not a particularly bad deal it, it's just a question of, of leveraging funding to, to meet these needs but so if the economic argument isn't very strong so how do we how do we dissolve this for not solving the problem how do we how do we get here um and as i mentioned at the start i, I work in gobi a mexican ngo where we have decades of experience and, and, and a great reputation of getting results working with, with small scale fisheries in, in Mexico. Um, and as we crossed into the new decade, uh, it dawned on us that, that what we're doing is not enough. Um, as an example, we've we've run projects in 40, 50 communities in, in around Mexico in the Gulf of California, Caribbean, Pacific. But Mexico alone has 5,000, over 5,000 small coastal communities. So we've reached like less than 1% in, in 20 years. And when with that, Kobe is, is, is just one fish in the sea too. Um, there, there's many seas and how without this coordination, cooperation and, and without all stakeholders pulling together, these, these wicked problems uh, related to, to the SDGs uh, are not gonna get solved. So how do we work on this? And I don't know if you remember this, this meme from a couple of months ago, but basically we're, we're trying to provoke a, a big change, but we're on the work. Uh, working independently doesn't is, is not going to make the, the changes we really need to, to make. No? So so what can we do? Um, as I'm sure many of you know, small scale fishing, they live in small scale fishers uh, are living in a, in a state state of constant adaptation. No, they, they're adapting to, to weather, to markets, to pandemics, uh, and they adapt quickly um, with with little to fall back on. Small scale fishers in, in the developing world solve whatever problems they have quickly. Some of these problems can, can move them towards sustainability and, and some can not. Some of these changes, sorry. Um, so at the same time, fishery management in Latin America is, is barely changed in decades. Now um, we have underfunded and, and overstretched government agencies basically playing a, a constant game of, of whack-a-mole where they're plugging gaps and trying to balance between conserving stocks and, and eliminating poverty. And in this space, NGOs can, can jump in and out, uh, importing solutions from, from around the world that often lack maybe the, the coastal, the, the social context, or, or the sensibilities for, for long-term impact once the NGO has, has moved on to a, to a new place. Um, if we were speaking in technological terms, this, uh, this is a space that's ripe for, for disruption. So at the same time, right now a technological revolution is already taking place in fisheries no um if i ask you to, to name some examples I'm, I'm sure many will come to mind we have ai video analysis acoustic detection satellite tracking blockchain traceability smart boats uh the list is is long so a lot of these components are Take a, a, take a bit of a web 2.0 approach where it's, it's your data and, and my platform where data is collected usually for free by an end user, it disappears into the cloud and provides value to the platform owner. Um, and this, this centralization and exploitation of data is, has been built into the, to the web 2.0 business model. That's why Facebook has got to where it is. Um, so by implementing this kind of technology in small scale fisheries, we're already implementing technology that's um, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be obsolete very soon as we move into this web 3.0 era. We're already, we're already late. So, so how can we change this vision? How do we apply principles from, from the web 3.0 in to, to sustainable fisheries? And with, with the decentralization of, of data, decentralized technology, and, and with, with meaningful peer-to-peer -peer interactions, users can get much more from, from this kind of model. It also means that we can we can leverage the work of, of hundreds of thousands of, of people um, working towards these, these big goals. Um, again, Facebook isn't Facebook if it's just you and five other people. It works because the, there's so many people on there. So to, to, to make this change, we need to we need to think like a startup. You know? A startup doesn't create a, a product for 40 communities in, in 20 years. It wants to grow and meet the demands of the highest number of people it can. 
and, and technology for all the good and bad can provide this platform. Um, by, by taking a, a smart up approach to conservation and innovation Azul, or blue innovation, which is our, our, our initiative, um, allows partners in the, the in the ocean conservation and, and sustainable fishery space to, to work on collective development and, and scaling of these solutions to, to an ocean crisis. And before you build, you always start with, with the infrastructure, with the foundations. No? So this is the sort of the digital infrastructure to support this model. So going on to the topic of, of data, um, data collection in the ocean is, is exploding. No data is, is, is the new oil, it lubricates the economy and, and flows between, between individuals and, and institutions. Um, yet at the same time, a lot of ocean data is, is locked away in silos, uh, either jealously protected or, or just, just fouled away and not seeing the, the light of day. So under that guise, so yeah, un, unused data is, is useless data, um, particularly because Huge investments are made to collect, store, curate data, thousands of days in the field, hundreds of surveys. Um, it's it's underutilization, is is very inefficient and then leads to a lot of missed opportunities. Uh, or, or even worse, the, the continued collection of baseline data that that uh, as if as if it had never been collected before. <clears throat> so as we move into this this web 3.0 era, we're living on, on the cusp of the moment where we're recognizing the value of, of our data. Um, I think this has been, over the last couple of years, become more and more apparent uh, in the technological space. And the internet giants are, are coming under pressure um, as until now they've been the beneficiaries of, of our data. So now more than ever, the, the individual or the, or the organization can and, and should own their, own their own data and have the power to make decisions over its use. So right now we're, we're going into the, the ocean decade of uh, so the decade of ocean science and, and sustainable development. And by, by creating the infrastructure and the incentives to maximize the value of the data for the owner, we can improve data collection on a massive scale whilst, whilst empowering the users and at the same time work more, more effectively to measuring contributions to these international targets, such as the SDGs and, 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 and including VAO's and um, guidelines for small scale fisheries. And, and just as in the web, yeah, as I mentioned, in the web 2.0 and as in, in the web 3.0, data continues to be, to be very important. We just need to recognize whose data it is. No? Um, everyone working in, in fisheries has or, or wants data. Uh, and this provides a lot of opportunities for value creation. So fishers have catch data, governments and researchers want it, fishers want weather data, um, governments and, and companies have it. So this is a there's a few examples on the side there. They're, they're, they're not, it's not a complete list. Um, and also important to remember is we're talking, of, in this case, about small scale fisheries in, in Latin America, where processes for exchanging this information are often not even present. So, with a, a Web 3.0 digital infrastructure, uh, we can manage these data flows through, through interrelated layers of technology that. Um, and maximize value and, and, and allow knowledge and innovation and capital to flow back to, to all stakeholders involved. And an important component here is being able to track whose data it is and where it's going. Um, and with, with distributed ledger technology, not necessarily blockchain, but uh, this kind of technology that can help us achieve this, uh, this goal. And as an example, each in, in this type of ecosystem, each sovereign user can decide how uh, and with who to share their data. Um, and then types of data include um, individual data, like, like, like my address or my date of birth, which maybe I don't want to share uh, with, with everybody. And then we also have organizational data, such as catch data, that if I'm a fisher, I can share with my, my fishing cooperative. Or we have mutual data, which we, we mutually agree to share. For example, if I'm a fisher, I can share with, uh, my catch data with, with a researcher who's studying these species. Um, and we also have contextual data, which is more um, aggregated numbers, no? um, anonymized aggregated numbers, such as numbers of fishers uh, operating in, in a state or, or a region. And as we build this uh, digital e infrastructure, we need, we need principles. Now, I'm not going to go into all of them on this slide, but uh, I do highly recommend the, the website in the bottom corner. And some of the, the components here are 
a, such as like a citizen centric approach. And that means designing the needs to meet the, designing to meet the needs of the participants. And that sounds simple, but are we sure that our goals as platform designers uh, of technology, are, are, are these goals aligned with those of, of small scale fishers and remote coastal communities in, in Mexico or, or Colombia? And we also need modular and, and scalable systems that can be adapted to meet the needs of the highest numbers of, of users possible. And we should also need to measure, measure our impact and connect to rather than replicate other systems at work. And that's an important one that I'm going to talk a little bit more about as we, we go into the talk. So this is where the Innovación Azul initiative comes in. Um, <clears throat> We, we have, well, the, the infrastructure has digital, digital logbooks for, for fishers and fishing organization, has management tools for fishing organizations such as cooperatives. Uh, and these can be adapted to a wide range of scenarios by fishers looking to digitalize processes and modernize their work. And this is important as we, we go back to this digital transition. No? Um, there, there is a digital divide in, in, in Latin America. There's a wide range of access to technology. Um, but it's providing a baseline infrastructure for, for each group to, to be able to build on and adapt to their needs. And then by including marketplaces for, for ideas, services, and goods, we can also promote economy, local economies and incentivize sharing. Um, our, and in this ecosystem, there's built-in data aggregators for contextual data that allows our, these previously invisible contributions to international agendas that many coastal communities are making um, such as the SDGs and, and file small scale fishery guidelines to be documented from the ground up um, as, as on, a, on a large scale. So the gateway to this ecosystem is, is the Pesca Data app. Um, we spent 2020 beta testing and, and in February this year it's been fully available for use. Uh, it's on both app stores, there's the code, feel free to download and use it. It has about 620 users at the moment um, from 53 fishing organizations and we're, we're currently scaling for, for growth. Uh, feel free to, to download it. Uh, the QR code there should work. It's in Spanish um, at the moment, so it's yeah, designed for use in Latin America, but it's, it's pretty, pretty intuitive, so you should be able to get on and use. Um, so what does this differ from, from what's currently on the market now? Um, it's not the first Again, a digital logbook is, is part of this ecosystem. It's not the only part, but uh, there are other apps out there that can use, be used by fishers in the market for, for capturing, um, for recording on catch data. So here, there's two different niches um, out there. One is sort of uh, an app created by, by an NGO or a researcher for, a, for collecting catch data, and the other is a market-driven approach, um, often related to traceability. Um, so, firstly, Pesca Data is designed to, to, to meet the needs of any fisher, not, not just any fisher, but also NGOs and governments can take part in that, in the ecosystem. Uh, we can use, uh, you can use the software and adapt it to your needs. Uh, and we're, we're trying not to, to have a specific niche, but trying to be this, this digital infrastructure that can be transversal across, uh, across all platforms. And, and secondly, users own their data. No? Uh, it doesn't disappear into the cloud to serve someone else's purpose. In fact, if, if you create an account and log data, I can't see what you're, what you're reporting as a fisher. Your, your catch data is, is your data. You can choose with who to share it. It doesn't mean you can't share it. It's just, it's yours. You can decide with, you share it with nobody, with yourself, with your fishing cooperative, your fishing organization, or the researcher, whoever you want. No? But the decision, the, the decision-making tools are in the hands of the user. Uh, and, <laughs> And then Pesca Data is also interoperable in the sense that with, with API connectivity, we can connect to other platforms at work. Um, and we're building this in from the start of this, the infrastructure rather than retro, retroactively fitting it um, to the existing ecosystem. And that's important because there are great tools out there, but maybe they don't need the needs of other fishers. So we can connect to that and, and use these common, uh, common data elements to, to work across ecosystems. And as an example, um, we don't add species lists to our database. We pull from, from existing databases, such as the, the iNaturalist network uh, in, in Mexico. And the last two lines on the graph there uh, speak to the business model. Um, so Pesca needs to operate long into the future. 
Um, so by creating value to the user, but also the appropriate capital models and revenue flows, we can create a self uh, a self sustaining ecosystem. And I'll speak a little bit more about that in the next couple of slides. So as I mentioned, we we field tested um, during the last year, and we've been able to build in a lot of recommendations from the fishers. The app can be used online and offline. It's lightweight. It's designed with API, API connectivity to connect to other platforms, as I mentioned. Um, and the idea here is to create a a seamless technological experience where for end users and not these digital data silos uh, where, where applications can't talk to each other. So ideally users can move between platforms and different ecosystems that, need, that meet their needs and their fisheries. And an example here is traceability, which is for always the, the hottest topic in, in marine technology. Um, we don't have a traceability component in our app. Um, most small scale fishers in, in Mexico are not ready to, to join a traceability scheme. Uh, they don't have the organization, the product, or the, maybe the infrastructure or incentives to join. Plus, in a multi-specific fishery, only a small number of seafood products are going to go down a traceability route. But we can connect. Pescadata can, the fishers can use Pescadata to record everything and then push uh, the, the required species down the traceability line using existing platforms, whether it be blockchain or, or otherwise. Um, and then, yeah, catch logs are, are a core feature of this. Uh, of this ecosystem, uh, particularly for, for fishing cooperatives or fishing organizations who want to be able to pull in data from, from fishers uh, that aren't necessarily all in the same place. And this aims to meet the, the needs of the most number of fishers possible. And in, in, as, as, I, as I mentioned, but it's, it's really important uh, to, to reiterate is that Pesca does or me, there's, I don't have a backdoor or any of the programmers have a backdoor into to, to seeing the data that fishers are uploading. They can decide with who to share their cooperative uh, everyone, it's it's up to it's up to the user. And there's a marketplace, but this isn't our, our traditional sort of no, it's not the traditional marketplace or a platform. Here, ideas and, and information have, have power. So when you go to the market, you don't just go to buy some tomatoes or or food. You're there's hustle bustle. Uh, you see your neighbor. You stop for a chat for a coffee. And yes, you can sell your fish, but that's not our main goal. Um, consumers for us are not a, a huge, a big target at, at present. As I, as I mentioned at the start, there are other platforms out there that do that do traceability and, and, and provide electronic markets. Yet, most fishers in developing countries have a have a, a lot of fishers in developing countries have a smartphone. So let's connect to these platforms with markets to and fishers who, who are ready to participate. But this marketplace here is more focused on on local economies. Maybe you uh, you have a spare part for your outboard motor. Uh, maybe you need a spare part for your outboard motor. You can search in a 20 kilometer radius of, of your community, or you can offer your services for repair, repairing fishing gear, um, or participate in the, in the co-creation and, and discussion around creating solutions to common problems, uh, either in your fishing cooperative, in your community, in your state, or, or across Latin America. Um, if you're not a fisher, you can also participate in these marketplaces. Maybe you're a researcher and you're looking for species-specific data um, at scale, um, and you don't want to leave your, your office. You can, you can use a, a, re a network of, of fisher citizen scientists in specific communities to, to help you collect the data for you. Um, corporations can, can reach their targets, uh, target audiences more effectively and collect market research on their products. And, and civil society organizations, NGOs and, and government can see the, the contributions of, of hundreds of thousands of fishers working towards sustainability and social impact. Um, and social impact uh, towards these, sort of these big global changes. And with the distributed ledger technology on which we're building the ecosystem, this information and these solutions and ideas can, can be tracked and valued as they're, as they're exchanged. So in Mexico, our goal is to, to scale up to, to 300,000 small scale fishers. Uh, and we're, there's more than a million fishers, uh, small scale fishers across Latin America. So once you, once you reach scale, what else can you do? Um, one thing what we are interested in doing and, and we're working towards adding are data aggregators to measure contributions to the SDGs and file small-scale fishery guidelines um, because 
most community contributions are, are, are not recognized at the international level. For example, does a fishing community have a community marine reserve? Um, there are dozens or, or hundreds of communities in Mexico who, who do, but this is hardly ever, hardly ever captured in national or, or international statistics. But with these public and pri private dashboards and data aggregators, uh, we can help incentivize uh, best practices and, and identify gaps or, or working towards these, these, these lofty goals. So, so peer peer to peer networking. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware is, is not new online, uh, but how do we digitalize the fisher to fisher exchange that that we know is so powerful? No? By connecting fishers to to share ideas directly, um, we can protect sovereignty and also create spaces to to discuss what interests the fishers. Um, we can promote the co-creation of solutions to common problems but in a digital way. And this is something that, um, unfortunately, the, the pandemic had a lot to, to influence in the design of, of this, as, as we now had fishers working over, over distances, participating in, in digital exchanges um, through, through the last year. And one example from, one example from, from before the pandemic actually was fishers in, in Baja, California, um, beginning to send us photos of, of lobster with, with soft shells. Their, their buyer was rejecting them and, and they were worried. Um, in this area, we work a lot with, with Stanford University in, in the US. So we sent the photos to the, to the experts, experts there and, and waited. And by chance, 3000 kilometers away in the, in the Mexican Caribbean, we had another meeting with, with some other fishers and we showed them, them the photos and, and immediately the Caribbean fishers said, that's, that's fresh water. Um, but well, Baja California is a desert. There's not a huge amount of fresh water, um, but it had been, there's been some unseasonal rains. Um, and when we reported back to those fishers, yeah, they, they were finding this, this lobster being caught on one side of the island facing a bay. So and a couple of weeks, weeks later, the experts from, from Stanford got back and yeah, they said it's fresh water. So here we can see how our one fisher 3000 kilometers away uh, on the other end of a country can, can help solve the problem of, of another in a different part with a much with a very quick feedback loop. And that, that's really important when we're talking about small scale fisheries where as we go back to the, the beginning of the talk, this this, this quick adaptation is, is critical um, to them moving on to to um, to be able to adapt to their markets and ensure income uh, for, for their families. So how do we how do we manage this? No, uh, how do we manage an ecosystem of, of this type? Luckily, uh, governance structures exist for this type of network. Um, one of them is is the platform cooperative. Platform cooperatives are are like normal cooperatives. It's just they operate digitally, and they're owned and operated by those who use them. Um, they they present an alternative to the platform capitalist models such as as Uber or, or Airbnb that focus on turning a corporate profit for a, for a relatively small number of stakeholders. And a platform cooperative basically uses the same technological principles, but with a vision for this, the sharing economy, but with more equitable and ethical, ethical goals. For example, uh, a platform cooperative Uber clone would operate the same as Uber, um, but with, with, soft, with software connecting a passenger to a driver, with the, but with the driver being a member of a cooperative so that um, the, the driver is using the the software as, as a service, and instead of taking uh, with the company taking a cut, the cooperative receives any any profit that flows back into the business. So this takes us full circle uh, to what we talked at the beginning of the talk, the, the Web 3.0. Here, the platform cooperative is putting the the value created by the user back into the hands of the user, not not the platform owner, like in the Web 2.0. And platform cooperatives can, can have thousands of members. Um, it doesn't matter where you are or how you use it. And you don't all have to use the platform in the same way, but you have a say in how it's governed and how it's run. And then an, an advantage here is that cooperatives obviously aren't a, a new model there. They're uh, well over hundred years old in, in many cases. And, and in, in fact, Martin, the Latin American fishers are already organized into, into cooperatives. Um, it's a very fin familiar model. It's, we just need to modernize and digitalize the, the processes. And remember this platform cooperative, unlike the fishing cooperatives who are, we, we're, we're getting involved in this ecosystem, the platform cooperative is not here to sell seafood. 
it's providing we're providing software as a service to its to its members and helping fishers organize their businesses connect with others and even use these numbers to, to leverage funding and opportunities for for sustainable fishing and one important well to shed light on on this digital presence and the and the digital divide in in, in many areas we did a we did a study a quick study on how many fishers in how many fishing organizations in mexico have have web pages um, and around of around 6,000 fishing cooperatives, we found only about 30 to 40 had uh, had a web page. So there's a very low digital presence across most uh, most fishing organizations in, in Latin America. But at the same time, these technological initiatives are already uh, already coming into play. So that's why we have this the importance of this uh, digital infrastructure to, to underpin everything. And as we start to come towards the end of the talk, uh, you may still be wondering how this helps us move towards sustainability. Um, and it's a good question, and I'll break it down into sort of three quick conclusions. But firstly, by by reaching scale with, with hundreds of thousands of, of users and, and building data aggregators, including the SDGs and final small scale fishery guidelines, we can identify gaps and opportunities in, in communities and states and countries. Where do, where do interventions need to be made? Where, do, where does effort need to be focused? Secondly, from a nonprofit point of view, we all know we need to go further uh, to new places, to new communities, to work with fishers and, and work towards sustainable practices. But resources are, are, resources are, are stretched thin and, and often poorly distributed. As I mentioned at the start, the organization where I work has worked in about 1% of Mexican coastal communities in, in 20 years. We, we don't have time to wait for their hundreds of years to, to reach the rest of the communities uh, and a lot of the other NGOs working in the same space sometimes work in the same communities we do so let's not forget the 99 percent of of fishers now um the 99 percent of communities that they haven't had the opportunity to to work with with others or move towards sustainability um so so finally how do we how do we yeah we know how powerful the the fisher fisher to exchange can be and um, we also saw how the pandemic forced a lot of this to go digital. So newer generations of fishers are, are digital natives. So now is, is the perfect time to, to implement these components of the Web 3.0 and also set the groundwork for a, for a digital sharing economy for, for ideas and solutions and, and mechanisms to work towards solving these, these bigger problems, such as um, the SDGs and, and helping fishers move out of uh, sort of precarious situations in their communities. And this, this path won't be easy. Much of this technology is still evolving. Some isn't, isn't ready yet. Uh, as I mentioned before, there is still a significant digital divide in, in Latin America, even between countries and, and within countries, uh, and, and limited access to technology and connectivity in some places. However, this doesn't mean that we should, uh, we should fall back on already outdated and, and extractive uses of technology. Uh, we should use technology for good. We should use it to empower the fishers. Uh, connect, collaborate, uh, and work together to, to solve these, these big problems. No? So thank you very much for, for your time, for your, and then we can, I'm sure we have uh, some time for discussions and uh, questions in the, in the Q&A in, in a few months. And I'm gonna put a, a few little slides up there so you can see uh, both app stores and, and some of the other materials related to this topic. Thank you very okay. much. Well, thank you so much, Stuart. And thank you, Gabby. Gabby has been answering some questions in the uh, Q&A. Um, <clears throat> and just to remind everyone, we can take questions either through the Q&A panel um, or the chat. Um, and, and you're welcome to po post relevant comments in the chat. Just uh, please use it uh, appropriately. Um, great. So um, we, we do have a bunch of questions already. Um, uh, we'll start with one, um, Stuart, I'd love to learn more about the ways in which the platform slash framework engages with issues of gender. That's, yeah, that's a, a good question. And we have, we do have specific goals on um, related to, probably this slide, um, related to increasing the, the participation of, of women in the ecosystem, because again, we're aware of some, some functionalities, for example, the catch logs, um most again we, we, we our organization works a lot with with gender in fisheries um 
and uh, I'm happy to put a web, web page up there. You can check out some more research that we've worked on. But in most fisheries, it's men who are doing the physical catching of, of the fishing. Um, but we know the valuable role of women in the value chain. Um, so as we've launched this year, the, our primary focus has been related to, to, to the catch logs and other functions for fishing organizations, which are, again, mostly focused at, on, on men, but not exclusively. Um, and then we're also including these, these, these aggregator, aggregated functions and, and, and tools for fish, each fishing organization to be able to evaluate the gender roles in their fishing in their organization. So are, are women involved as, as members, are workers, where are they participating in the value chain? Um, that's something we want to, to add to, or will be added over the next couple of months to, to the dashboards each fishing organization manages. Uh, and also aggregated up into into these data aggregators. So, um, and also look into yeah, to 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 expand beyond the sort of the, the extractive part where it tends to be dominated by by men, and, and more into the whole um, the whole providing tools and processes for the whole uh, the whole value chain um, where where more where there's more better gender mix. So it's something we're we're, we're aware of and we're working towards and, and trying to. Um, Again, use use a use a platform for to cover those bases. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that came in: Could the Pescadata app app be modified to add new variables to collect different kinds of data based on the specific needs of each, each fishery? Yeah, again, definitely. Um, the moment we're trying to keep it as as the, the basic data collection as simple as possible, but there are, you can also add, um, bio, sorry about biometric data and things for, for individual species and fisheries as, a, as an extra. So, and components can be added. Um, we're already in discussions with, with some other organizations to be able to, to add, uh, sorry, more species specific or fishery specific uh, information. So yeah, definitely. The, the idea is it's, it's adaptable as possible for, for, uh, for any type of, of fishery, because again, in, in the Mexican case study, um, fishers are, are have to provide some basic information to the government on, on their landings, but if they're participating in a fishery improvement project or an eco certification, then they need they need additional data. No? So um, ideally, it can be adapted to, to add that kind of that, those kinds of data collection tools. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm going to read two questions, which are both about uh, financing the the or the business model for the app. Um, the first one is, I'm unclear on how your business model can be financially sustainable. Who pays for the data management service and storage, and how do you generate profit? Um, and another question that came in is, with a plan for the platform to be moved to a cooperative uh, model, how will they be financed without the fishers having to pay? The, 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 the long-term vision is that the users can can contribute to, to um, covering the cost of the platform. So if you're a member of the cooperative, if you're a fisher, you can uh, you can pay. Again, it depends on the on the scaling of the platform. If you can scale up to thousands of users and minor contributions over a year can help cover the cost of the platform, cover the uh, the operating scheme. There, there's different data data and revenue flows. Um, I can post a link to some more information on our on our website. Um, but the the income to the fish, the platform cooperative can be covered by partly by yeah providing software as a service to the fishing organizations with a with a minimal a minimal fee, um, but also from from uh, um, sort of sponsorship and, and 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 data data sales, but in the sense that the users are, are aware and are participating. No, no one's going to be uh, and, and and any any because it's a platform cooperative model. It doesn't necessarily need to generate profit. It just needs to generate a, a turnover that can cover the operating costs, and any additional fees and, 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 and profits can be channeled back to to the users, to the fishers, to, to invest in, in sustainable fishing and, uh, and and that kind of project. So it's it's that's something that's under development. Uh, I didn't the platform cooperative uh, at, at present. There are no platform cooperatives operating in, in are established in Mexico, but legally it can be done, and we're working on that, working with the government institute. Uh, the social economy to, to work towards that uh, platform cooperative creation over the next couple of months. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Um, there's a question: When fishers own the data themselves, how do you how do they use the data for fisheries management? 
So, I mean, th th this is a, a good question. I think it can be dived in deeper in, in many ways. Now, one part is why incentivize to, what's the incentive to catch? And also how do we, uh, a question that regularly comes up is, is how do we trust the data? Um, one, one thing is that fishers are, are generally required to, at least in Mexico, are required to catch, catch and record basic uh, data on their catches uh, due to the government anyway. Um, and then if they're participating in, in other kinds of projects and they need more data. So, and also the incentives to, to report correctly because the data is going to the fishing organization, whether that be a permit holder or a cooperative, um, there's not really much incentive to, to under report at that level. Um, then it, for fisheries management, this, this data is still going to, still going to the government. They still have to report. Um, to the, to the national fisheries agencies that the data that's, that's collected. Um, the idea is that having more, more standardized and more, uh, more regularly collected data can help both fishery management at the, at the, at the wider scale, but also at the, in the community level where, and this is something we've regularly seen where if fishers have the data to make decisions, they, they don't have to wait, I don't know, five or 10 years for, for the government to change fishery management, to change a close season. If they have the data on hand, they can change it there their practices on as they go. And an example of this is some fishing cooperative changing the, the, the seasons that they fish certain species based on, uh, on catch and oceanographic data because of the way species reproduce. But they're not waiting for the, the government to, to, to make the change because in, in many cases, the, 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 the resources are, are, are the priority is not there, but fishing community themselves can, can work on their own, their own management level at the local level. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Um, a question, what constitutes a Fisher organization dashboard beyond the catch log visualization of its members? Sorry, could you repeat that? Sure. What constitutes a Fisher organization dashboard beyond the catch log visualizations of its members? So I guess what would be on a dashboard besides uh, catch log visualizations? So yeah, each, each fishing organization has a has a dashboard uh, that's on, uh, well yeah, accessible through a browser where they can see uh, catch catch logs and, and various uh, breakouts of distribution, who's catching what, which boat, etc. They can also manage their their users. They can manage their boats. They can manage their permits. Um, it can it send you reminders to renew permits. You can download the data in in, in Excel and CSV, um, and. And, and very soon is, is one thing we'll be adding over the next couple of months is tools to improve the, this digital presence. So each, as I mentioned in the talk, like very few cooperatives have a, have a website now. Um, so we can, we, can, we can create a public page where they can list what they sell or very simple information on what, what they sell, where they are, how to contact them. They can give them a digital presence that can be, can be searched through, through Google or, or other ecosystems. Um, so, um, and they can manage that to, to share the information they want. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Do you see large nuances between countries or regions where components of this app work well and countries or regions where they don't work well? Uh, for example, in some places where fishing processing plants are large local employers, have you received pushback against a marketplace app that could bypass them, even though you said the main goal isn't for fish sales? Not, not so much um, pushback in, in that sense, because again, yeah, it's not the, the idea is it's more of a local economy. You can sell the food you, you make, or you can sell the, you, or you can post looking for pieces or, or services you offer. But on the, there is a big difference in, in on, on sort of the, the message that, or the, or the, the, the utility that different fishing groups see, groups see uh, when they, when they're, when they're interested in using it. For example, um, in, we, we worked a lot in, in, in Baja California and the fishing cooperatives are very, are very, very organized. Um, they have their MSC certified for their lobster fishery. They export all around the world. Um, and the, the need there is, is, is not necessarily to improve their administrative processes because they already have great administrative processes. But there, there they have the, the more the need is to share ideas, share solutions and, and, and communicate with other fishers. Whereas in other parts where fishers are still working on, are still recording, the entire cooperative is still working on paper, then the sort of the sales pitch is, is very different because it's, 
digitalization of a process that doesn't yet exist. So it, 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 very, it does very much depend on, on, uh, on the vision organization and also sort of the, the, the path they've taken into um, formalizing and then digitalizing processes to date. Okay, thank you. Um, there were several questions that came just sort of um, wondering about any sort of um, the reliability of the uh, phishing data that's collected. I'll read the two specific questions. Um, do you already have some experience with some set of this app data for fisheries management? How was it concerned regarding the reliability of the entered data? And another one is, how can you be sure that the data do represent the reality of the phishing results? So yeah, the, the, that's the second one I'll answer first. Um, I partly answered before, but is that because I, we're, we, we are not the, the judge of, of what the quality of the data, because, because the fisher is reporting it to their phishing organization, the, the incentive there is to, to, re, uh, to report correctly because it's what they're catching for the, for the fishing organization. Um, in terms of fishery management, again, where fishers are participating in, uh, for example, an, e an eco certification or, or, or a FIP or a fishery improvement project, um, the data, again, because they're working towards a goal that they, they want to achieve, the data seem to be uh, uh, what's needed. But again, because we aren't, we aren't using, we, when we say we, we as the Pescadata development team and we as the NGO aren't uh, curating that data is that it's going the fishing organizations are doing it themselves um i can't speak to the specifics really okay um great okay and there were several questions that gabby answered uh, we may revisit some of those for the oral because i'm not sure if everyone could see the answer but so let's see um if I'm a user, how can I see who to share my data with? Is there opportunities for researchers and managers to reach out to fishers and ask for access to the fishers data? Is there built in structure to connect different users to share data where there might be mutual interests? A present is it's from it's by downloading. Um, so you can download into Excel or CSV and then send. Um, but our, our goal is to be able to, yeah, to have a lot more user control uh, in app. To, to avoid having to, to, to download and move. So uh, partially, yeah, to answer the question partially, uh, and, and there will be yeah, a lot more options on, on how that can work in the future. Okay, thank you. And um, what if users decide not to share any data? Is that a problem for the? It's, it's not a problem for us. Okay. It's, it's, yeah. it's a problem for their fishing org. If they're, if they're part of a fishing organization, mm -hmm. it's uh, not, not ideal for that. But Again, you don't need to be part of a fishing organization to use the to use the application, so uh, that's not a problem. Okay. Um, I, I also saw one question there about uh, if a user exits, uh, where fishers want to remove their data, um, and that, that's a good question and it relates back into to privacy. You no, know? so there we have. Um, I mean, we we built this around um, the 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 European GDPR standards for for data. So I mean, that's that's our above and beyond Mexico's privacy uh, terms and, and conditions. But yeah, our, our privacy policy is, is based on the, the GDPR standards. So um, again, user if user requests their data, we, we're, we're obliged to, 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 to let them remove it from the system. Yeah. OK. Um, there was a question about whether there's any options for reporting bycatch. Bycatch, there are different ways. Um, it can be part of. Um, the again because we, because we because we pull from the the national uh, sort of a national species list of, of six hundred species or so um, which come from from the Mexican Biodiversity Institute um, where fishes so you can add all these species as 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 catch at the moment we we can't add it as um, specified bycatch. But again, because most we're talking about sort of yeah, the tropical fisheries where they're very multi-specific. Um, I mean, any, most bycatch still gets uh, gets sold as well, so it still enters the value chain as, as if it was a, a fishery species. Okay, 
Thank you. Um, a question, how do you see this platform scaling given, scaling given use, issues of access to the digital space and digital tools in many small scale fisheries context? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, we're we're scaling again in Mexico. We're scaling on on on, on different uh, in in different ways in different communities. Uh, either working with individual fishers and scaling there, or even with like digital influencers and uh, our local community influencers. Um, and also, we um, it, it really depends on the on the local context and then the local community. Um, is the is there Wi-Fi connectivity or not? Is there um, is there yeah power all year round or not? How, how is smartphone uh, penetration in the community? And, and that really varies by by country throughout Latin America, but also by by community. You know? So, um, but at the same time, things are changing fast. Like I, I've been working in uh, in the Mexican Caribbean for the last ten years or so, and we've gone from zero internet in all the coastal communities to 100% internet in all the coastal communities over the last four years. Um, so things are changing a lot faster than maybe we expect. Uh, and having this digital infrastructure there for when fishers are ready to move on board is, uh, is, 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 is part of our goal. OK, thank you. Um, let's see, are there any plans to have to change between languages? Yes, definitely. Um, at the moment, our focus was was Spanish as part of the Latin American market. We're we're very interested. I mean, in, in English and Portuguese. Uh, we've had a couple of discussions in uh, with groups in Brazil. Um, but again, having having multilingual support is 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 something we want to have on the uh, at short order. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, picking up on the bycatch question, uh, is the species list you refer to just for fish species? We would be interested in recording bycatch of marine turtles. Would the app be able to do this? Uh, right now, no, but it can be, it, the species list can be added, yeah. So again, if there's, if there's a, a public species list with a, where we can get an, an API integration to the app, um, there's no reason why we can't have more species. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you. And then let's see, there's a big push for researchers to compensate local community members, including fishers, for their knowledge and their data. Do you worry fishers could be taken advantage of? What are your thoughts on charging researchers to access fishers' data? I think it's a great idea, um, but I think, I think it um, needs to be balanced. Um, I think if, again, from working with a lot with, with citizen science in, in, in coastal communities, um fishers are are, are are regularly participating with researchers now like throughout throughout latin america throughout the world um and the the they're often investing time and effort um getting data maybe beyond what they're required to report for, for to the government so i've seen no reason why they shouldn't fishers shouldn't be compensated for their time and effort in collecting additional data for a researcher but at the same time um, it's, it's an agreement to be, it's, it's, it's something that needs to be agreed on between, between the parties involved. Um, I also think that from a researcher's perspective, if you could have, you could use our, 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 our marketplace and our, our discussion forums to get in touch with, I don't know, if you're looking for lobster samples of lobster from, I don't know, 2000 lobster samples from the Mexican Caribbean, you could reach out to fishers and, and arrange to do that without having to to go to the field to spend money on transport hotels and, and things so in, in in some ways it could be financially beneficial to the researcher to to, to use this network of, of fisher citizen scientists um and, and sorry build build a group that can work towards data collection for for their needs but uh, i think it's a very case by case specific data yeah case okay thank you and uh there was a question that had been what Gabby uh, addressed to the the questioner, but I'll ask um, to everyone so everyone can hear. Um, does the app let you choose how and in what format to download the data? At the moment, it's just a CSV for Excel, so you can download in in a in a in a, in a spreadsheet. Um, we don't have we 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 have our, our short short term plans are to to 
smooth streamline that for reporting requirements to the Michigan government. But if outside of that area, um, we haven't got nothing else at the moment. But um, yeah, uh, we're open to, to recommendations and ideas to, to make it as useful for the, for the user. Uh, let's see. Do the financial transactions happen outside the app, like a research paying for data? Again, at, at present they do because it requires a, a, re, a thorough review of Mexico's fintech laws. Um, at, at present, yeah, transactions take place outside at the app at the moment. Again, for the future, uh, we, we want to have that included in, over the next couple of years, and, and that can be another part of the revenue model as well. Okay, thank you. Um, the Pesca data app is also, um, oh, is it, are there also um, thoughts of making it uh, for recreational fisheries or is it just for small scale fisheries? Um, real, really, as long as, if, as long as your species is there, um, you can use it however you want. Uh, again, we, we don't need to onboard you. Um, so you can download and you can use, if you want to set up a, a group, as, as, as an individual user, um, you can download and use. If you want to use it as a as a group, um, we uh, one one of the team needs to set up the fishing organization. But apart from that, it can be used in any scenario, really. So, um, yeah, if, if if it works for you, you can use it in recreational fisheries too. Okay, thank you. And um, sort of playing off one question that had come up, what what are generally the time requirements for a fisher to use? The, the app? So the, the, again, from, from field testing and working with the fishers, the, it's, it's not really, free, well, you can use it at sea, but the idea of using it on the landing site where you're, you're, you're sort of delivering your catch to the, to the cooperative or, or you're sum, or summarizing everything you've caught. So um, time requirements are, are, are similar to what you'd expect to use in, 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 in a, in a, in a an analog log book, a written log book. Um, so it's not, it's, it's very simple and, and quick. There's like, it's two screens to record your, your catch um, and, your, and your costs of, of the fishing trip. So the idea is, is this, it's as simple as possible. If you want to add more specific data, so biometric data, um, yeah, like a, uh, any, any specific, si specific size lens of individual fish, then it takes a, it, there's an additional screen, but the, the, the core functionality is, designed to be as quick as possible. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Stuart and Gabby. I feel like we've been grilling you uh, for the last half hour. Um, this, this has been great. Uh, lots of thanks coming in from, from uh, people who are able to um, uh, attend today's webinar. And we really appreciate you presenting on this. We appreciate all the work. Um, and we look forward to getting updates um, on Pesca data. So thank you very much. and. Um, we thank everyone who was able to attend today and we hope to see you on some future webinars. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, all right, bye everyone.